will stand to the for the pledge of the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first item on the agenda is comments from the audience regarding items for future consideration. If anybody has anything, please step up to the microphone. State your name and address. Seeing none, we'll move to reports for a the search model presentation. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Alyssa Kambu is our district behavior support specialist, and her um, comrade in arms is Jen Townsend. CISA Autism um, Consultant. Um, we just wanted to share a very brief overview of, of CERCs since we're implementing it um, in the district. Um, and I just want to share one observation. Um, as part of the DPI grant that we got to support um, implementation of the model, um, each of the, the teachers, and we're focusing on Edgerton, but it is a district implementation, each of the teachers were required to develop all the CERCs protocols for one student. Um, they have found this model to be so effective uh, that they decided they could not limit it to one student. So um, as a result, they are all doing all of their students um, on the autism spectrum using this model this year, which has been um, an enormous amount of, of work, but I think it speaks uh, to the power of the, uh, of the model. So um, I want to publicly thank you again for your support because none of this would be happening um, without it. I'm uh, Jen Townsend. I am a educational consultant for the southeastern region of Wisconsin. I've been asked by um, Whitnell to come in and support the social and emotional learning of the students that we service here within this region. And so I'm excited to get an opportunity to present the information in front of you guys this evening. So thank you. So with that, um, Whitnell's mission kind of drove us to really look at a social and emotional um, standpoint for how do we service kids with social learning differences, including students with autism spectrum disorder. And with that mission, that highest quality of personalized education, when we look at our common core and we look at the components of, of those elements within that, they're academic driven, but what's hidden inside of them are social and emotional learning objectives. And so because it's such a personalized system here within Whitnell, we moved down the path of identifying um, and using a developmental progression model, which is called the CERTS framework. Um, CERTS stands for social communication, emotional regulation, and transactional supports. And what that does is it really allows us to meet the child at their ability and it gives our educators um, a scope of where should I be working on and what should I be thinking about um, when it comes to this child's social communication ability. How do I help this child emotionally regulate in a manner that's sensitive to others? Because we all know we have those moments when we emotionally regulate in a manner that's not so sensitive to others um, and it's not socially accepted. And so it's important for us to make sure that we understand the developmental progression of that and, and our educators understand that and therefore our families can learn that as well and we can provide, again, that personalized opportunity for the students in Whitnall. So social communication by definition is the spontaneous and functional communication and expression um, that, is, that an individual possesses in order to communicate with somebody else. Emotional regulation is that development in the ability to maintain an optimal level of arousal um, and through self-regulation and mutual regulation. Mutual regulation being how you regulate with other people, how you use other people's nonverbal and verbal feedback um, to, to regulate your state. Um, and transactional supports. The, the really nice part about the CERTS model is its transactional supports. This is how do we, as competent communication partners, support an individual that has a social learning difference. And these transactional supports help us modify the environment, help us support the environment, and help us promote independence of the student. Um, so we also have a developmental progression and a scope and sequence that we look at for the educators that provide services to these students. Um, now with that, 
Um, there, are, there are four broad priorities that we look at within the CERTS model, and this is where our focus has lied this year within the district. Um, one of the big priorities is really enabling those environments for students with social learning differences to be able to be a part of their least restrictive environment. The next piece is understanding the nature of a social learning difference, including autism spectrum disorder. Using and knowing that it is a neurological disability has helped the staff here within Whitnall take it from, take actions of these students from a different perspective, from a different lens, and knowing that at times it's their brain that's misfired or it's their brain that doesn't understand the, the social stimuli that's coming in, and it allows the staff to provide those supports in a manner that's sensitive to their neurology. Um, and it's one of the first of its kind to allow us to look at it that way um, and really guide us in, in looking at that developmental progression so that we truly understand the way that the brain works. Um, another component and a huge priority is the educational planning piece. Again, going back to the district's mission of personalized um, learning experiences, Educational planning, we have individualized education plans, those IEPs for students um, that qualify. However, there's not always the plan that goes into place that's shared across all disciplinary areas, across all content, and across the family as well, and providing a level of transparency in what we do. So being able to plan out the education that matches the student's individual plan that also aligns with what we do here in the state and, and in the region. And the effective practices that go along with that. So it's not just teachers saying, I think this is a really good idea or I'm going to follow my gut. We're looking at some of those evidence-based practices and what, what makes the most sense to put in place based on the individualized plan, based on the neurology, and based on the environment that we're trying to um, provide the student their learning opportunities. And the last priority that we have in here is ongoing monitoring and fidelity of the program so that we can ensure success and, and build a sustainable system um, because we understand that teaching students is, is one priority, um, but having a higher quality of life and long-term predictors of success for these individuals is critical to our society as a whole. And so that's what this, this framework does allow us to see. Um, one of the, the largest components of the CERTS model is an assessment piece to it, which goes through, again, like I've mentioned earlier, the developmental progression of how an individual does socially communicate and emotionally regulate themselves. And in this, in this assessment piece, it's broken into a Likert scale where we use a 210 rating scale. It has inner rater reliability points built throughout it. There's about 15 or 16 sectors where it comes in that allows for the, the data to be very valid within the assessment process. Um, and it's a team-based approach. The parent, as well as the gen ed teacher, as well as an outside therapist, as well as um, an administrator, as well as a behavioral specialist, um, as well as a speech language pathologist, a principal, all get a chance to weigh in on this assessment. Because the way a child socially communicates may be different across people, across environments. And what a child looks like at home might be vastly different than what the child looks like in the school. And what the child looks like with their best friend might be very different than what they look like with just a classmate. Um, and so this assessment allows us to go through um, a systematic way of doing that. And it's not just a broad standardized assessment. It's broken into three different areas based on the child's ability. So we're not sending any information or we're not asking information that we don't think that the child has the, the ability to, to grasp, to get, to learn from, and that we can build a comprehensive plan off of. Um, I think that's been one of the biggest pieces of the plan is that it now then goes into the child's present level of performance. And we know that the present level of performance in a child's educational data drives their educational plan. Um, so that assessment supports that as well. What we have done this year um, is we've taken a, a whole district approach where a lot of our staff have attended a training on the CERTS framework and using the CERTS, the CERTS model. And there are pockets of it being implemented really well throughout the district. However, what we wanted to do with being a recipient of the DPI mini grant for supporting students with um, autism spectrum disorder, using evidence-based practices, we wanted to take a focus on one site and do it really well. 
at one site. So then that becomes a training site within our own district. And that really helps support a sustainable system. Um, so being able to, to create that opportunity and using um, the principal over there um, and having pieces of this be built into what he already has set in place in his building, such as staff development meetings. Um, all of the information we share, he shares pieces of it. Um, the principal is in attendance in, I would say 90%, I don't know exact data on that, um, but he has been in 90 to 95% of all of our meetings surrounding this framework. Um, maybe not the entire duration due to his schedule, but he's truly embraced it and made it a part of the climate and you can see that in, his, in, in the mission of that building as well. And when I read this to you, the mission of Edgerton Elementary is to create a learning community that serves the unique academic, social, and emotional needs of its students and empower students to see themselves as successful learners to ensure that every student meets their academic standards. With that piece there, we know that social and emotional development is critical to academic performance. And when we break it apart based on social emotional learning and based on Castle's research surrounding this, which is nationwide, um, and Castle's research will tell us these are the five broad domains in which we want to address. And we know that these are positive predictors of long-term out outcomes of success. And within these, there's a direct alignment to the CERTS model. And I'll share that with you guys. Under self-management and self-awareness, um, you have social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. Um, that breaks down into the emotional regulation component. There's two types of regulation that we all possess, self-regulation and mutual regulation. And in that self-regulation, what, what Castle's work does show us is that self-management and self-awareness are key components in order to be successful long-term. And Emotional regulation is one of the three, one of the broad domains within the CERTS model. But how do we teach that? And what CERTS does is it provides us the developmental progression of how to get to those smaller skills. So we're not just shooting at what we think is best for kids, rather we're using an assessment to drive our decision making. Mutual regulation, again, falls underneath of emotional regulation within the CERTS framework, um, but then directly aligns with Castle's work under social awareness and relationship skills. And then we look at um, social communication and in order to have um, responsible decision-making skills, we have to have um, competent social communicative abilities. And therefore, there's your direct alignment in the way that we can do this for social emotional well-being of all individuals. So the current work at Edgerton specifically, um, being an awarded site for the DPI mini grant, um, is we have created monthly grant networking meetings where we meet to get together and we talk about one specific evidence-based practice that, that the building had decided would be most beneficial in some of the initiatives that they set out at the beginning of the year to do. Um, we're fo focusing on the visual learning styles of individuals with social learning differences, including autism. And within those social, um, excuse me, those visual learning styles, we're looking at a lot of the visual supports that we know can support their learning. Um, as, as auditory learning disappears, um, visual learning stays static um, and helping students become independent with managing those resources themselves and it becoming a part of the, the system that they use at Edgerton, aligning with positive behavioral intervention supports as well for all learners. Um, developing a system for the school-wide use of those visual supports and then collaboration between departments, the school, and family. On our DPI um, mini grant team, we do have a parent representative that participates as well as a gen ed representative, as well as special ed administration, um, speech language pathologist, and an occupational therapist, a behavioral specialist, and myself. So it is a, a dynamic profile of individuals sitting around the table on a monthly basis, coming together to, to talk about how we're using visual supports and what's our protocol for using them, not just putting them in place to think it's going to solve what's going on or it's going to um, stop a disability from, from being present. Rather, it's going to support the child's emotional ability and social ability so that they can engage in a way that makes sense for their, for their neurology. The other big piece with that is um, the way we're supporting Edgerton this year is through um, CERTS consultation. And with CERTS consultation, we're also looking at creating a sustainable system. And that means that we need to have networking meetings. We need to have monthly meetings to talk about what does it look like? How are we doing this? As Dennis said in the beginning um, in his introduction of us, um, it, was, it was my hope coming in that each educator would pick a student and go through an entire cycle 
of one year cycle of using this process. The educators um, ethically felt that they could not do that. And they felt that they needed to do with all of the students that presented social learning differences within their site. Um, they've done a, a really nice job with that. They have felt um, the impact of doing it with all in your first year. Um, when you're learning something and implementing something simultaneously, as you guys probably know in your own professions, um, that's really difficult to do. Um, so they've, they've taken the coaching really well, the consultation really well, um, and they, they see the benefit. Um, recently, some of the anecdotal I have information, a student um, recently had his educational planning meeting, his annual educational planning meeting, and they felt so good about the goals. The parent felt fantastic about the goals. She felt like she had input. The family had input into them, and the meeting went incredibly smooth for, for this child um, and, and for this family and for the school. And it really does represent the child's ability um, and where the child is. No, it didn't feel like a deficit model. It didn't feel like my child can't do this. It felt like my child can do this, and this is how we're going to support him to reach this goal. Um, so that's just some anecdotal information that's not in our presentation tonight. Um, developing those protocols has been really critical in having a dynamic multidisciplinary team approach because that has allowed all voices to be heard in the protocol development of what does this look like for me as a gen ed teacher? What does this look like for me as the administrator? Um, and that's been incredibly helpful and that does create a sustainable opportunity where we can tweak a protocol and we're not just doing it differently because I think I should do it one way and somebody else thinks they should do it another way. There's a systematic approach to how we're gonna do this and how we're gonna use this and how we will sustain it. So conducting these assessments on a, on a more regular basis, um, conducting assessments not only on our students but also on us as teachers, as educators, making sure that we're providing the right interpersonal supports and the right learning supports based on the child's abilities um, and their environment. So I will say, leave you guys with this last um, piece of data here in knowing that when we can support a child, social and emotional development and social emotional skills, we will see an 11% increase in academic performance. Um, and this is nationwide data research. Um, the researchers are here quoted in, in, um, in parens. And social emotional learning, we all know from our own personal experiences, it affects how we perform in our day-to-day -day activities. But for somebody to have a social learning difference and a deficit and maybe a disability in this area, it's even more important that we're using a developmental progression to teach the right skills and support the right skills. And that's what the SEARCH model is doing for us. So I want to thank you guys for your time. And I don't know if I should open it to questions. Um, um, questions from the board? Anybody want to uh, ask a question? Go ahead. This model can be used for any age child? Correct. Or is it just, it's just, we just chose to implement it at Edgerton? We chose to implement it at Edgerton based on the mission statement of, of the building um, and based on being the recipient of the DPI mini grant. But yes, it goes all the way up and I've done the assessment on myself and uh, you, you can do it on yourself um, because it does talk about how you emotionally regulate and I think that those are key components. But yes, it goes through the entire developmental progression of, of us as a society. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question? Go ahead, Luann. Just a comment. I think it's, <clears throat> it's an excellent model. It could work for all students. It really could. So I'm really proud of our staff for deciding to take on all of our students. And you know, we need to continue to move in this direction where we um, sort of modify the plan for each student and then ensure that they're successful. I loved what you said about it's not like it's not a model where we say we can't do this and you know moving to how can we and then committing the resources and that's what we're here to do commit the resources to make that happen for every child regardless of their ability so I think it's a I think it's a great model and I've heard a lot um, in some of my other uh, involvements about social emotional learning and there's a lot of conversation even in Milwaukee about you know whether you should be looking at test scores or social emotional learning we get some debates on a committee I was on last year about that and there's somewhat conflict around how to measure that but the castle was one of the resources that we used on that as well so I'm becoming more aware of how important this is to for all of our kids not just um, well, thank you. Thank you for that comment and the support. You mentioned um, that normally it's you take one student, and yet we chose to take a group. How many were actually involved? 
There are 10 students currently. Okay. And when, when can we expect to see results from those 10? We have results already put into their educational plans. Okay. Um, and annually, we will be updating their current assessments. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be based around their, their IEP cycle, their so annual IEP. So kind of end of the year, you kind of... I, th I think it's more sporadic throughout the next year, but you'll see you'll see concrete data supporting this throughout the next school year. So um, would you say we're on track to hit this 11% gain in academic performance? I would say we're well on our way because we have some students that were not able to access the gen ed curriculum who are now within the gen ed classrooms receiving their instruction like their peers. Not all the time, but they're doing it more and more um, in the manner that they can regulate themselves to, to accept the instruction in the way that we're teaching it. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and just Go on ahead. a school note, I think it's important to note that um, one of the kind of unanticipated consequences um, is that because um, staff is feeling so much more secure with the model in place, um, we're looking at transitioning two students that have been placed in you know, off-campus programs um, for autism um, specifically uh, to be transitioned back um, for the beginning of next year. So that's that's a huge um, benefit. Um, it certainly has a big fiscal impact. So, um, I appreciate the work that they've done to get us where we are. Thank you, Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next on on the agenda are the uh, policy changes. Um, who's going to take the first readings on these? When are you taking this, or what are we doing? Okay. Uh, I got to get over to that page here for a second. The first one was uh, actually uh, the board. The board members that are on the committee actually worked this one. Uh, we worked all the ones there in the 100. Um, too many pages here. All right. We, we gave some leeway for this first one uh, to allow the orientation to happen um, and not box herself in to, um, what, what, Kathy, do you remember what the wording was prior? Um, the prior wording was um, just, it, used, it did say following the spring election, and it right. wasn't very clear and concise, and we wanted a, a, more of a framework so that yeah. you, know, you knew when you were going to do that mm -hmm. orientation with the new members. And so the um, committee thought that within 60 days was a good framework to work within. Yep. And then access to the school board policies and procedures. Luann had talked about updating the folder of information is that correct but we the main thing here is it's you're not going to get we're not going to give them a policy manual anymore yeah we we're just going to gonna point them that. in the direction of where it is online yep. that was the main change there and to include the district goals as well as the superintendent right goals. right that would just be an inclusive policy then mm -hmm. cool. yeah i mean minor changes our packeting highlighted the changes so right. i yep. think it's it's, it's good and then the second one, uh, Dennis. Yeah, well, before we jump to the next one, any discussion on on um, the new board member orientation? Any comments or questions on that? Before we I just, jump ahead? Um, one comment, I just hope that it's well within the 60 days because I think a board member being on the board for 60 days without having um, an orientation is going to really put them at a disadvantage to sit here for two months without really knowing what's going on. So mm -hmm. I would hope that that would happen sooner. Okay. okay, if no other questions or comments on that, let's move to uh, first reading of policy 342.8, uh, section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1973. <clears throat> Can I back up for just a second? If I remember right on that timing thing, it's 30 days before you're seated anyway, just about, isn't it? If we understood that correct. So that really did give you 30 days to get something done. I think it's a pretty tight time frame. The time the election is right. until we actually right. Just clarification right. on that. So it isn't it is sixty four weeks, yeah. right. It isn't yeah. sixty days since the time they're seated. I just wanted to. I think it's still good. Okay, sorry. 
Good evening, Dennis. 504 is up next. <laughs> Dude. Okay. <laughs> well, this was brought to us because uh, we did not have this policy. Right. right. And it was suggested from the from when we um, purchased the uh, WCA, WSAB uh, review that we do this. And it's pretty much, and Dennis can speak to it, but it's pretty much all form except for we um, customize it with Whitnell's names in there. You have anything to say about this one, Dennis? 504? Yeah. Um, other than it, it really needed to be um, updated, um, the policy hadn't reflected the um, ADA amendments from 2009. So um, in the fall of 2012, we did an in-service for all the 504 coordinators, um, updated all the forms, and put a manual together that reflects those changes. OK. Any questions or comments on this item? If not, let's move to uh, first reading of policy 363.5 on the assistive technology. Who's taking this? Eric, did I hear you technology, that? and right away I look at Eric. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, this is a 504. This is the first students with disabilities. Oh, it, it does once in a while. Okay. Um, this, uh, this was just basically an update based on the um, WASBO recommendations um, to make the language more specific. And also, um, we kept it um, as opposed to special ed to um, students with special needs because it could also cover ELL. Um, or possibly other um, situations that might be outside of special ed. So the, the current policy is being completely stricken, as it says, and the new one is in place. Okay. Hey, I didn't have any questions. Anybody else have any questions or issues on this one? Okay, if not, um, first reading of policy 723.4 on emergency school closings. Not that we had any of those this past <laughs> winter. Lowell, you worked on this um, with Joel, but basically the, it's a minor change um, where it says a decision shall be reached no later than 1.30 p.m. Uh, you don't, you can't predict when in pipe's going to break or um, something happens where we have to, you know, leave the building. So we just said as soon as possible. Um, and it's really important to always do it as soon as possible because the parents want to know, unless it's 4.30 in the morning, they don't always appreciate those calls. Um, but they do like to know as soon as possible. Did you take home, Michael? Slept right through it? Maybe stop making coffee. <laughs> it was just to give uh, our superintendent and administration um, a leeway and not box them into that 1.30 time because, it, like Lowell said, it could happen at different times of the day. Okay. Four times. It's because you're special. child. Get too many kids, Mike. It actually, but it, it refers to the activity. Communications plan. So Later. If, if there's activities going on that day, Say, we, right, if, it clo if we close school, right, and all of a sudden it gets nice out, or the storm passes, or, or it gets up to 20 degrees, Dr. Holtz would have the, op the latitude. See, and for those activities, typically we like to just close them down, but um, a lot of those, I mean, the kids are, juniors and seniors are driving to them. You know, if, if, assuming it's not what, um, bad driving conditions, you know, that there's, we don't have to worry about them walking when it's um, 10 degrees out or something like that, because they probably won't. Um, but, <clears throat> okay. It, just point of clarification that the, the what we're, by striking in no later 130 and adding as soon as possible, it actually pertains to the activity and not necessarily the closing of schools. So right. I, I'm fine with that. Just it gives the athletic right director time to make some calls and sure. stuff to the That's other right. teams. And Any other comments or questions on that? I just always thought that the activities were um, canceled when school was closed, so I was surprised to see that 
that there's an option of having the activities in the evening, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, but especially if you look at that third paragraph right underneath the as soon as possible, then it says if school is canceled due to inclement weather during the school day, all interscholastic and all other activities of any kind shall be canceled. Is that the WIAA regulation that if the school is closed, you cannot hold an activity that evening? Mm -hmm. No? No. Nope. Well, you made a good point there, uh, Stephanie. Well, Nancy brought it up, too. Nancy. Is it is very that's, conflicting. That's in, in conflict. I thought we had, we had uh, fixed that because it, we went with the part that went from the, uh, uh, the handbook. The handbook says, brings that top part down and gives us well, when is uh, when is the next board meeting? We have we have our uh, two weeks from today. Um, yeah, two weeks from today, and yeah, we are meeting prior to that. Twenty four. And the next board meeting is the twenty four. So um, let's put this on the agenda and we look at this. Okay. You have a policy meeting prior to that. Yes. So you, are you saying put on your agenda for the policy? Yeah, committee what we'll meeting? have to do is um, the next policy committee is after the 24th. It's on the 26th. Oh, okay. So 26. we'll have to okay. this until April. Hopefully we don't have any oh, more inclement weather dates. I remember. This is due to inclement weather during the school day. In other words, it's I, yeah. not what I make. In the, if I make the call before school starts, there is still an option. During the school day, if it's noon and I say, this is terrible, everybody's going home, that's when... It's, auto, it's an automatic. It's but I, school but I still wonder why it would be an option to have activities in the yeah. evening if you have school goals. Well, big changes happen in three, four hours. I mean, you don't want kids traveling um, in the morning and then for, to tell parents, why don't you have them here at 1 o'clock because it's going to be nice out. That's not going to work. However, if it's you know it's going to be nice at one one thirty, there's no reason why you couldn't have the activities as scheduled if you know, it happens it just gives you the flexibility and I also I wonder what kind of message that sends are we more concerned about after school activities or school activities well and, I, and if a child is sick that they don't attend school they're not supposed to be and they feel better they're not supposed to be attending after school activities if they call them sick to the school day no we're saying I'm not making so, a value comparison between the two what I'm saying is, if it's a, um, the weather is so bad, you know it's going to be 30 below, and we have a, a, a wind chill advisory up till noon, and then it's going to switch, and it's going it, to, there's no more below zero weather advisory. It's back up into the highs of one and two, um, where it's safe for kids to travel. There's no reason to cancel the basketball game that's supposed to happen that night. Because parents are going to bring their kids, kids are you know, um, so it's not a. It's, it's really we wouldn't do a value judgment between the two because one obviously outweighs the other. You know. So why don't we just first. have the policy committee relook at that and then bring it back? Well, what I would also, you want? What would you want in it? Because there's no point in us. That's a policy meeting. committee. No, what what do you want us to look at? Because I think I still think it's fine because it's giving administration flexibility. Are you saying you don't want that in there? There's a conflict between paragraph no, no, two and two paragraph three. They're two different. No, they're not. One is if school is closed during once the kids are in school and then they closed it. The third paragraph is if school was canceled, they weren't even there. Those are two different issues. There's no conflict there. Yeah, the, the third one, the third paragraph, Bernie, if during the, you have during, right. the, during day. the school day, that's right. the key. Yeah. So that's the key. This phrase. really is okay unless you disagree that we should have anything if schools closed are you you know are you saying that we should by policy automatically cancel interscholastic activities if the board feels that way then we change this policy otherwise the policy is just giving administration more flexibility to decide that based on what they're right. seeing happen that's all really so you, that's what i mean why take if you want to take it back to the committee then give us direction you're really not supporting the policy and what would you like to see us change well, we need to be more specific right. between closed and canceled. I don't think we need to be. We just need to understand it. This is the one that's been in place for mm -hmm. a long Years. time. Yeah. So, it, but if you know, if, if uh, you think we can come up with something more easily understood, we can give it a shot. 
Uh, then I'd like to see another change to have um, the administration have the flexibility to call staff in and not students. Because when we had these four days of cold weather, the staff could have come in, had their training time or whatever, or collaboration time or whatever, and um, then taken one of those days that we had set aside and used that as a regular school day. Should that it's be? It's close for the kids. The clo it's close for the kids because it's too cold to stand out and wait for a school bus or walk to work, whatever. Staff drive to work, so I don't know that it always has to be close for staff. Do you think that should be under this policy or, or a new policy? Well, it specifically says that only the people that report are the custodians, and right. if they can come to work, why can't other people come to work? Mm -hmm. Point well taken. Okay. So now I know what you want. Take a look at that. And we'll maybe have to look at other policies if it's somewhere. And we'll look at changing the language to make it clear. Okay. I mean, you're almost there, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next item is Doug. I think you've got them all, won't you? Yes. We. Uh, lumped them together um, for that purpose um, would make a brief comment about each of them and then see if anybody has any questions I reported to the Finance Committee last week on the uh, status of this year's budget which is uh, tracking very closely to last year's budget in terms of percentages of revenues received and expenditures made <clears throat> we'll get back on our cycle of quarterly reporting <coughs> excuse me um, after the end of this month um, and we'll have a better idea um, where we are at that time with three quarters of the year under our belt um, presented the audit report uh, along with the uh, responses to um, some of the items um, raised by the auditors um, even though I had um, worked with um, individuals who have primary responsibility for some of those items earlier in the year uh, we're having a meeting uh, this week just to make sure that um, we're where we need to be in terms of uh, corrective actions um, also had a, a memo in there that was an update on the health insurance plan to date I think that all in all the uh, transition to the high deductible plan along with the uh, health savings account um, went pretty well and um, we still though need to be working um, to uh, lower the actuarial value of our plan it's at approximately 94 percent right now it needs to be um, below 90 so we're out of that platinum status as they're it uh, so that we're um, not having to um, pay any of the penalties uh, and fines that go with having um, the high uh, very high value plans so um, we will be presenting uh, some ideas to you uh, next month for ways that we can um, help drive down our costs and try and get that actuarial value down so um, be more coming on that later and that's all I have to say it the uh, for period ending January 31st 2013 is that meant to be 14 no there's two pages there I did 13 oh, I and 14 yeah. oh they're almost identical wow percent remaining is that close oh and I f forgot to mention one thing on the on the audit report um, last year um, we ended the year with a surplus of revenue over expenditures which becomes an increase in the fund balance of about seventeen thousand dollars which is pretty tight so but um, we did not lose money last year
So we are addressing the, uh, I don't want to say infractions, but. Um, yes, uh, the, the meeting this week will actually be a follow up to ones I had earlier in the year, just so I can see that we're right where we need to be. Because the main thing we don't want to have is uh, audit uh, issues repeated. Okay, questions? It's noisy down here. No, we're good. It's a good report. Anyone down here? Questions for Doug? Okay, hearing none. We can go to new business. Proposal to rule, uh, roll out the uh, WHS one to one program. everybody, uh, Eric Ran, Educational Tech Director for the District, uh, with a proposal to modify what we had intended on doing for the rollout of our mobile computing initiative, uh, specific to the high school. So initially, our plan, the original plan, was to roll this out in two segments. Next year would have gone out to the freshmen and the sophomores, and then we would have rolled out in the second year to the juniors and the seniors. So we've been planning since early September for next year's rollout already. It takes us about a year of lead time to get going on this and get everything ready to go. And that included meetings with the high school department chairs, input from the high school teachers. We ran a student pilot with about 80 students involved in that. Um, one item was really, really clear very quickly, that a two-year rollout for us here at Whitmill would not work. For some districts, it has. But we have a problem where we have a lot of cross grade level classes, especially at the sophomore and junior level, where upper and lower classmen are mixed. That presents us with a problem. If I'm a teacher, I'm in the middle of a lesson plan, now I have a problem maintaining what we would call curricular consistency. My lesson plan becomes difficult within a classroom because I now have a situation of haves and have nots. Some of the students have the one-to-one -one technology, we're embedding it into the curriculum, and then I have a bunch of my students that don't. Quite simply, we're asking the board to allow us to modify the plan. We would roll everything out in a single year next year. Now, that also presents a problem because the annual budget will not bear that cost out, and we know that. It's going to add right around $155,000 to the program budget next year. It's a one-time cost. Now, to be clear, that's money we would have spent the following year anyway we're just rolling it down into next year's budget, but we also need you to you know, allow us as administration to be a little bit creative with the funding and that more than likely a lease purchase. Spread that out through a multi-year lease purchase, but again, it's going to impact next year's budget. Questions? Just, you're looking for support, and I totally support that. Okay. I don't, but... Before I, you can We're talk about voting on it. Right. It's, it's I'm just saying, well, it's an action item. And so, in here, action. you say, it will be delayed. you say it, um, today. latitude in seeking our, our alternative ways to finance the single year old, mm -hmm. a multi year lease, or a similar financial plan. Yeah. What is a multi year lease? What, what did we do with, we purchased the middle schools outright. Yeah, we did. We purchased the middle okay. schools outright in the single year. And the problem is we can't do all four years of the high school in a single shot. Mm -hmm. Adding that 155, it just doesn't make sense. You want to jump in, Dr. Holt? Yeah, the, you can do, I mean, the leases can be two-year leases, three-year leases, four-year leases. If we were going to spend the 155000 irregardless the following year, basically we just, it won't impact the budget quite as much as it sounds because we'll actually be paying for it that second year. It's just we're, we're, going, we're entering into the agreement this year, getting the stuff, spreading the costs out over two years so it'll actually balance itself out. Doug's a lot better at the leasing stuff than I am. But What's the, is there additional cost for leasing? It's a dollar buyout at the end of the lease. 
depending on how we finance it. And there's a bunch of options. We'd probably end up going through somebody like Coke Financial, something like that, Apple's own financial company to do that. We just got done with a, we had a four year lease out that went back several years. We did the large laptop purchase and everything because we want to spread that out over time. And at the end of it, we pay a dollar and we own the equipment coming off the lease. But what is, what is the, they don't just lease stuff, they're there to make money. So what is the cost of leasing as opposed to outright buying? It actually doesn't. If we do a two-year lease, it doesn't cost us any more other than a dollar. They don't jack up the well, price Well, you make equipment. a payment every month. Yeah. They generally have some rate of interest, though, that is figured into a lease, just like if you're leasing a car. We don't know what that is until we go to market. Right. But right. It's an yes. implied rate. They, uh, they, they have a factor. And, yeah. But would be when your point is well taken, yes. which is... Yeah. Let's look at what the lease plans are, all right, and and let's see who would bid on it. We'll put it out for RFP, and here, this is it from Apple, this is it from XYZ, uh, Bankers Bank out of Madison uh, would love to get into the lease program for um, uh, schools and municipalities. I can have you, you know, con some of them there contact you, and we'll look at three alternatives or so as what they would do. I mean, and who's got the best deal? It's simple as that. When, when I, when I, I'm, I'm for the iPad initiative, but the spending of the money that we don't have, I, I'm not for. Um, I think we need to cut other places to afford this. Just like a personal finance that something comes up Right, I gotta have uh, my car fixed, but then I gotta I gotta not go out on Friday night in order to help start paying for to get my car fixed. But I don't see that here. I see spending it, but I don't see anywhere saving it to try and pay for it. And that that's my problem. You're not asking for it out of this budget. You're asking for it as $155,000 in addition to what you will be budgeting. From the tech plan correct so to quinn's point there may be money in the budget that we can find in the budget to cover some of this we don't know yet because it's next year's budget and the problem is is that we need you know with a program this big we need that much lead time you know and if we let this go too long we get too far down the planning road and we can't execute on it unless i have a board decision to allow the rollout in a single year so you do need a board <coughs> You even do that, need a board even, decision. Even things, okay. you know, as a lease or anything, too, most of these companies, um, now I have not been part of a lease here at Whitnall, but the ones I did with MPS, they actually require the board to sign off on it. The board president must as initiate, not only superintendent, business manager, it's not something just administration can go do on their own. Typically a board president must sign mm -hmm. off on that mm -hmm. type of a lease that big. So. Sure. so when would you have to order these? Ordering's not the problem. Ordering comes in after the budget rule. I mean, we did that in July. So it's first week of July, get them in coming in here because it takes us that long to okay. prep. Um, it's more of anything is, you know, when we look at training of the staff and everything else, mm -hmm. um, you know, if we do a single year rollout, that means we're planning and training the entire okay. staff. And we have to start planning that now and start putting that all into place and everything. We handle a lot of the training in-house, but not all of it. And scheduling people during the summer when it's very popular to do that kind of stuff, it's difficult, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so that's why I'm I'm watching days from my point of view tick by, and getting nervous. Um, you know, last year we knew the budget would bear it by this point. We already had it in the tech plan. We were well down the planning road um, at this point, you know, um, and so I know you know this is something that we'd like to bring back to the board with some options or whatever for a vote at the next meeting. Um, so we you know either yes we're moving ahead full steam or no we're not. And tonight is the, the presentation part. We were going to bring it back for the vote on um, the, today's the 10th, so it would be the 24th. Well, we need more information. To even, uh, we don't, I don't even know, you know, it, the ad's 155000 to what? What's the total cost of all this equipment? How many units are there? What's the total cost? Okay. All right, that, that's one. Two? All right, so we know, okay, it adds 155 to the next year's budget. Mm -hmm. So what's the total cost of the equipment? And then let's compare lease versus buy as an option. If, if lease becomes the more attractive option, one of three bids or something, we may not have the pressure on the budget. 
because those payments are going to be spread over 12 months, 36 months, whatever the case may be. So you just fund it accordingly. So, and with with how quickly technology uh, advances, this becomes obsolete, you know, very quickly. So, um, we we need. I'll be glad to work with you and help you get some bids on the lease um, option. But you know, we we need to know total cost of equipment and then compare it to a lease option. I don't think you'll get any pushback that the one-to-one -one initiative, we, you know, that train has left the station and we're going to continue down that path. So, and we go from uh, laptops to gym floors. Look at the worker here. Look at the worker. We had a good day today with no school. I do like the full days off because it gives us a full day to do maintenance in the district, so that is nice. Um, I'm really here just to take questions about the work. Um, it's really just a point of order um, to get a proposal this high through the board because it exceeds the $15,000 threshold. And because these flooring companies are doing so many schools over the summer, I really want my schedule, the Whitnell schedule, that works with athletics um, to get approved early so that I can get into the on the calendar so I just have one question did hmm? you budget for this it is going to be in included in next year's budget next year's budget yes 2014-15 budget yep the work will be done in July okay yeah we're gonna we typically um, since I've been here we're, we take the first two weeks of July and we just kind of shut down the pool and athletic areas we go through clean do some of that screening and recoding the gym floors um, this year we want to take it and actually take that one gym floor all the way down and so that's about a week, and then depending on humidity, dry times, you know, could be a little bit longer, but I'm trying to get it done. Plus, it's going to give us some new lines in the gym, which we need, and it'll take some of that water damage that happened before we did the stormwater project out, you know, some of that cupping in the floor. So um, we probably could stretch it out 15, 16 years, but it's really, I think we're, it's time to get this done, and then we'll move, like I said in the, in the memo, to the old gym get that done and then middle school gym so we'll, throughout the next you know three or four years we'll be painting the new gyms you know updating you know the flooring look and you know just keeping the safety items you know on, on the reoccurring budget so um, why didn't it come through finance first this this is something that's going to be going in my operating budget and so it's something that I can get in if, if it's improved you know by the end of the month I can account for it in my operating budget, and then that goes forward um, as one of my projects for summer. And this 22000 is just for the North Gym? Correct. And that's yes. the newer gym? Yes. That gym's got a little bit more cupping in the floor, and um, the other gym is a little bit more seasoned. You know, being an older gym floor, it's got a lot of coats of finish on it. This will actually be the first drum sanding of that floor since it was installed in 1999 so isn't there a lot of firms that do this i mean only having two bidders seems there's a couple but like i, I put in there um i really went to my colleagues at um, metro buildings and grounds in waswo and wanted to work with flooring contractors that have done a lot of these floors they know that the paint that they're going to put down isn't going to um, come up with different finishes and they just have an excellent track record and something as important as our gym floors I did not want to take a chance um, you really only get one shot to drum sand it and stripe it so um, those are the two vendors that I listed in in the proposal I feel are a win-win you know um, contractor for the for the school district we've worked with other gym comp gym flooring companies and screening and recoding ever since I've been here and some just, you know, they, they hire summer help and they give them a quick training. Um, and they come in and screen and coat the floors and it doesn't always look the greatest. So I, I just didn't want to take a chance with, with our gym floor. Okay, other questions? Yeah. And there was just as a final uh, point, they're going to be working with uh, Scott Bruning, the athletic director, to maybe get a new logo on the floor. So, you know, the gym will have a new look and feel to it. Um, that that expenses in is in the proposal we're not doing a ton 
you know, we're going to get four color pictures or anything like that on the floor, but it's just going to be a different logo, a little bit more updated to match the stadium. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited. It's going to be a nice project. Other questions? I guess you got the next one. Oh, Eric's got this one. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Matt. The initial proposal to the board for our new uh, phone system and replacement of our current public address systems. Uh, in complete irony, Chris Kampf apologizes for not being here doing your videotaping tonight as he is down because we have no connection at Hills Corners Elementary at this time and they have no phones. That happened about two hours ago. Um, so they're working feverishly trying to get that up and running right now. I think somebody's playing a game with me as I'm supposed to be up here presenting about that very thing. So. Quick little background on this. Uh, it's part of the technology plan that we approved two years ago as a district. Uh, at the time, Matt Karshna had come up at that time and had talked about PA system replacements. This initially was just a phone system replacement. And at the board's request, we were asked to merge the two projects to present money savings um, and to also present a single unified system. Our current phone system is failing. Hasn't been produced in 14 years and the company's been out of business for eight. That means parts are getting very, very hard to come by when something breaks. We're generally calling down to the backwoods of Florida. Uh, I don't even know where he finds that stuff, but to, to find phones when they break. Our PA systems, HCE and EES are currently failing as well. We're having multiple calls a year for maintenance on those that we shouldn't be having. The WMS one is also outdated. The only one that's 100% functional is the high school right now. Couple goals for this. Single unified system for both phone and PA across the district. You know, we always talk about, you know, we hope for the best here at Whitmill for every person in this district, but at sometimes like this, we got to plan for the worst. And so, if that horrible crisis situation would happen in a system like this right now, you know, Dr. Holtz needs to put our entire district into a code red and lock us down. We can't do that immediately right now. Current system would take at least five phone calls to do that, then you better hope that somebody picks up on the other end. This will allow us to do it. He'll have a magic code, he punches it in, and he could literally public address the entire district at one time for those people, you know, administration that would handle that type of situation. Um, so it's kind of our one single stop for our safety and emergency communications. We had six initial vendors that took the RFP, three backed out shortly thereafter. Because we were merging, we wanted that unified system. They said they did not have the capabilities to handle that. I'm actually happy that they did that. They didn't waste our time any longer and that they backed out when they did. Three vendors turned in bids. They were due on February 14th. And then we narrowed that down to two finalists. And those two finalists presented to Whitmill staff. The two finalists were ESG and TDS. There are some employees and representatives here from TDS tonight if you have any questions for them. So some major parts of the project. The largest part is the actual phone and PA system contract. That's the biggest part of this. But we at Whitmill internally, we're acting as our own general contractor for this, try to save some money. Um, and also one of the big ones was is we didn't want anybody touching our network. Our network is rock solid. If it isn't broke, don't fix it, right? So we don't want anybody messing around with that. Uh, we need to connect Edgerton. Right now we have a weak link in our network. We actually broadcast all of our network signal over to Edgerton wirelessly. Um, that's not real reliable, and so we want to hardwire to them. We have some internal wiring. That's actually the smallest part of the project. We do have to put some wires in the walls in a few places yet for some phones. Um, they are currently wired. And so that's kind of the, the tiniest part of the project. Those are things that are going to go along with the big contract for the phone and PA system. The recommendation that we're bringing to the board is that we contract with TDS for the phone and PA system. It would be a five-year contract on their hosted voice over IP system. It's a, what we call a turnkey solution. Basically, it's installed. They provide all the service, take care of everything. If there's upgrades to the system, whatever, they take care of that for the contract period. And they would, along the way, obviously replace all the public address systems and then tie them directly into the phone system. This would some of you we move forward with. It's a summer 2014 uh, project installation. It would come out of next year's budget. What questions do you guys have? 
I'll make a statement that this was presented to us at the Finance Committee mm -hmm. and all three of the members, myself, Stephanie, and TJ, who's not here, um, did agree with your recommendation to go with TDS. And we had questions at that time and you sufficiently answered them. I apologize for all the information. I tried to pare a lot of stuff down. The bids were huge. They were upwards of 200 pages a piece. Spent a lot of late night reading and we tried to pare everything down to just the essentials and uh, we gave you an overall budget there and everything. Um, gave their detailed budget for TDS, our recommended vendor, kind of stuff. So why did you choose TDS over the other company that I don't remember what it is? Two things. The ESG. The, yeah, ESG was the other one. Um, the fact that they provide all the service and upgrades to this, basically it's a, for the term of the contract, we don't have to worry about that. And that's a, that was a big selling point for us. That, again, it's, they call it turnkey, it's kind of the, the industry term for it. But we're not touching that. Um, and the other system, once we got out of a three-year contract with them, so let's say we were in year five and there was a huge major server upgrade, that's on us. Unless we have a service plan with them that we then have to add into the cost annually. And there's different levels. We actually asked them, they came back. There's anywhere from 900 to $12,000 a year, depending on what kind of service. So if we wanted the service plan where they took care of everything, they called the gold package type thing, that was over 12,000 a year. Uh, that really added into the cost and everything. Because we did some projections you had there of a mm -hmm. five and a 10 year total cost of ownership. Um, but the one part that was missing there was what happens if we want a service plan in years six, seven, eight, nine with you know the other company. That was a big, big divider for us. Okay. Let me just ask a couple of questions. Um, of the total cost, mm -hmm. we have an operating cost monthly, and then we have an equipment cost. Yeah. Is that right? Can you pop that up to see it? This is what you're looking at? Yeah. Okay. It appears to me our fixed costs, which um, is... Um, mostly equipment mm -hmm. and then there's a paging system which is equipment yes. so it ranges from roughly 250 roughly 235 to 250 mm -hmm. and then ESG has upfront costs an additional 164 Correct. which all they're doing is is prepaying what looks like their monthly fee it's not it it's isn't. different okay. so the two systems are fundamentally and technologically different ESG system, we own it, it's called on-premise. Basically, think big boxes of servers down in the wiring room, and we own that equipment when we do it. That's why we have such a big upfront cost. The equipment cost is much larger in that respect. Best thing to do, it's, it's uh, you're gonna buy a car. Are you gonna lease it, or are you gonna own it? That's really what this is. And so in TDS's model, it's called hosted. Most of the stuff, the server, the back end, all the infrastructure stuff, is down at their server farm, not here on site. And so we're kind of leasing a service. We're getting everything as a service provided to us, where in the other one, basically we pay for it up front, we own the equipment, and then we go out to AT&T or Time Warner, they're basically the only two providers around here. Just think of the old Ma Bell, you know, phone bill you get at home. Mm -hmm. And we would pay them then to make that connection. With TDS, we're basically leasing their service renting it, whatever term you want to right. use. That's why you have the higher monthly fee, but then they take care of everything. And again, all the equipment's on them too because it's on their premises and they take care of and maintain it. Here. And what do you mean by a 40% E-rate? We get E-rate funding through the federal government, which is for connections, generally. For us, we pay like our Time Warner internet bill that we pay each month. We get somewhere between 40 and 50% off. Now I'm estimating to the board conservatively right now because Whitmill's on a bubble and we alternate back and forth literally by just a few kids every year. So this year we happen to be at 50% E-rate, but we can't look a year or two down the road and know that we're gonna have that. 40% is a better conservative estimate there because literally if we have four or five kids that are on free and reduced lunch leave our district, we now drop that 10%. And so for us, you know, I want to give you the conservative estimate on what this would cost. And so what that does is it knocks down those what are called tier one monthly fees. Uh, right now our AT&T phone bill we have in our traditional system right now, we get 50% off this year off those monthly bills. Now TDS's system has gotten rated by the FCC as a tier one system, which means that we can E-rate that monthly cost. So, but I'm giving you the E-rated 
costs up there. They're actually higher than that monthly. Those are the yearly versions. So I, I, got, I caution the board because I, I, I'm sure many of you looked at, oh, look at 10 year cost TDS 635 roughly versus 582. What you really need to do is present value that income stream or that monthly fee mm -hmm. over that 10 year period to really compare properly. Because that upfront cost with ESG is money out of our pocket immediately. Correct. Whereas with TDS, we're spreading it over a 10-year term. That was term. another one, you know, when Nancy asked the question, you know, we're looking at all these projects that are coming down for this next budget year, and there's right. some major capital projects. This one allowed us to spread that cost out over time. Right. Where ESGs was a major upfront cost. I mean, we would be literally looking at how we're <coughs> going to fund this uh, to the tune of several hundred thousand dollars right up front. Have you... Um, and have you gotten um, referrals from anybody? We did. Any we other? Called, they gave us a laundry list of references. Okay. And what I did is I called uh, the other school districts that they had on there. I didn't necessarily care about the businesses. If you'd like me to call them, I can. Got no, going school recommendations. Monticello okay. is the closest one that they have current right now. Talk to their tech director. They're happy. They've had no problems. So no service outages or anything like that, which is really what we were looking for. Uh, we want to know if there's been downtime. Okay. Any other questions for me on this? Any questions for TDS? Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Oh, move on. Thank you. Okay, I guess, Lowell, you're going to substitute to the best of your ability for Tony, <laughs> who is <coughs> yes, I will. stuck um, in sunny Phoenix but for, for Tony. And um, before I get into that, I do have to compliment Eric on the uh, amount of time he put into this, the phone thing, because he drove Kathy, me, and Doug crazy, because on Friday night, he'd say, here's the numbers. Then Saturday morning, well, well wait, that, I got these. And then Sunday, and then Doug and I are going to, we get our, our uh, um, we get our little adding machines out, and we're trying to compare the numbers, making sure they're going straight. So he put in a ton of time, and I appreciate his effort. Just wanted to say that publicly. Were you talking about the upset secretary? <laughs> <laughs> Secretaries, you had yeah. E and I going. <laughs> um, anyway, on to the uh, instructional support staffing. Um, we talked about this at the admin team meeting. I know it, it came to you in admin team meeting notes and then in this formal um, present, or not presentation, but the report that Tony had in the uh, board packet. But just to highlight one or two things, starting with that first paragraph, it's the request is to support the curricular instructional support personnel. In other words, this is a request to support what the teachers are doing in the classroom. Um, he talks about the PLC, the shared personal practice. This is going to be a big part of educator effectiveness. And in that second paragraph, um, he talks about the teachers working with each other and their student data through continuous interaction observation. So we need the teachers to have time to be able to observe what the other teacher is doing, analyzing the data so that if um, like Quinn, Stephanie, and I are English teachers, and we uh, have a common assessment, and my kids just um, flounder. They don't do well at all. Stephanie's do pretty well, and Quinn's practically ace it. Yes. Well, then we better go find out what <laughs> Quinn is doing. So we sit down and we'll analyze the data, and then um, these people will sometimes free up time for like Stephanie or I to go watch that other class and see what they did different to um, improve the educational process. In that third paragraph down, um, that's the specific request for full-time instructional effectiveness coaches and for K-12 curriculum coordinators. You've already approved the curriculum coordinators, but just in the core areas, this is adding in those areas that it talks about. The last paragraph on this page talks about that educator effectiveness, and that is a requirement. We have to do it. Thankfully, we, did, we, we wrote uh, a grant uh, between our district, Greenfield, Greendale, and so we're, the, the training part, um, that's going to be covered by the grant. We, um, uh, the educator effectiveness process of setting SLOs and PPGs, and I hate acronyms, so I made sure I wrote it out. The, the professional practice goal, that's the individual teachers, you know, what, what's their professional practice goals. And then uh, for teachers in the educator effectiveness model, it's the student learning objectives, and when we're evaluating the principals, it's going to be the school learning objectives. 
So each, they're supposed to identify two and they're evaluated by it. Um, and 50% of it right now is based on the student performance. Um, the beginning of the, the next paragraph where it starts with K-12 curriculum, that's where I said they're already in place for English, Math, Science, and Social Studies. We're adding them for the other courses as well so that they have those leadership roles. And then um, the specific training, and this is kind of like when you're talking with uh, Eric about why is this so important now. We don't want to come into uh, board meetings and saying we need a decision right this second kind of thing because that's uncomfortable for board members. It's uncomfortable for us to even ask for it. But uh, um, we do have to set up the training and it's required in July and August and that's where the training is going to be uh, co-written and uh, received by, or, well, the, by the grant and uh, that's Whitnell, Greenfield and Greendale. Um, and then the, the part in bold, that's the superintendent part, right? If you're following our admin meetings, when we're doing our staffing, um, we want to do staffing as much as humanly possible without any additional money. So, you know, what, what can you repurpose? What, where can you get the funding to, to pay for what's happening here? And with that, that was that spreadsheet Tony gave you, but um, I gave you a colored version right before the board meeting and is that the correct note one no the the one you passed out yes the one that uh, it has red on it just double checking with is the number oh, yeah. right? no I printed off the old the whole one I'm sorry <laughs> Doug luckily and he was the one who's gonna take this spreadsheet um, but are you comfortable explaining it or you mean it? Sure. Take one and pass it down. And, and this is the one that I have. The, one the, the bottom line should say 462.50. All right, that's the, the current one. one. The board and package. Is that what I gave you? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. And then I want you to notice that I gave you the nice colored version. Doug's was going to be black and white. Um, so looking at the colored version, Doug, can you, can you explain it to him a little bit? He and Tony worked on this together to a degree. Tony was looking at um, how to reallocate funds by uh, making some changes in the um, scheduling for people next year. <clears throat> you can see that <clears throat> he's got <clears throat> 182 days for this year, 180 for next year. Um, we worked out what the some of the costs would be on a daily basis, for example, aid, uh, teacher aides, busing, food service. Come in. Um, and um, subtracting this or next year's from this year produce the, the difference column. Um, down, oh, about halfway down the page, there's a line that says total. Yes, 264,000. That's the result of, if you look at um, the total hours right above there, that's 60 times the uh, staff hour per hour cost of $4,400. That gives 264,000. Uh, if you move over a couple of columns to the right, you'll see the same math, only it's 96 hours this time. Uh, produces 422,400 um, difference between the two of those is the $158,400. So um, he has a total reallocation of roughly $280,000 and then um, shows you at the bottom um, the instructional effectiveness coaches the data analysis position and the K-12 coordinators would be taken out. They would offset that 279,462 um, with about a $462 um, uh, net for the district, but basically it's a wash. And the, the only other comment I have on it was um, Eileen had asked about that the data analysis and where we kept it as a placeholder because she doesn't remember doing it 
So I told them to add it in here so you could see it, even if um, whether you use the 90 whatever it was we had for a placeholder this year minus what we took off um, for the communication coordinator. I just told them to put it in there so you'd see what it would look like. We don't have any plan right now to add this in because he's not sure we're absolutely going to need that position, but he wanted it so that people are aware we're looking at it. It's If we can get our effectiveness coaches and our instructional, um, that's part of, that'll be part of their role as well, the data analysis, because when I read that, this part of the report that Tony wrote out, um, they do a lot of work with the data, so we're not sure we would even need all of it, but we don't want it to slip slide away totally until we're positive we can slip slide away. And that's the start of the song. Who wants to uh, ask the first questions on this? <laughs> well, Eileen emailed me with a few questions. Um, one question I had was with the early release aids for collaborative release, wouldn't those aids have been on the clock anyways? Oh, she can email me low so I can research them before. Um, and it would be a lot easier. So, the instructional aids don't, so if we would have had, like at the high school, if we would have had early release instead of late start, they wouldn't have, they would have gone home. But we're paying them at the elementary and middle school level to cover the kids that stay. I think she's right. She's talking about the two hours mm -hmm. per day. So, because of early release, we pay additionally two hours to the aides. No, but you would have if they if we wouldn't have offered the care, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have been paying them. Okay. And by having the full days instead of the early release, they wouldn't necessarily be um, at school those days. That's the reason that that cost me. Okay. And she said, of the four full-time instruction effectiveness coaches, the analysis given, does that include salary and benefits or just salary? That the 215 should be the salary and benefits because the 6, 12, 18, 20, um, a new teacher's salary is roughly 35 and then 15 for benefits. So it, it's... You're, you're guesstimating based on who you're going to hire. But irregardless, we would probably move more experienced teachers into this. But when you move them, you'd probably pull in the first year teachers, then, and that's where he's costing it. And then um, the 20% reduce reduction in workload, who's that being picked up by for the uh, uh, coordinators? Jack, you do that scheduling, can you? Can you um, it speaks to that the, the four, four uh, K to 12 coordinators are going to have a, not only a, st a stipend, but a 20% uh, reduction in workload. Have you figured in who's going who's gonna to pick it up and at, where is that cost coming from? No, at this point, um, we haven't determined where those positions would be. So, um, you know, kind of depends, like at the high school level, um, we, schedule other teachers to cover, you know, those sections. So, for example, next year in science, you know, as I work the plan, I know that Laura Saletti is only teaching four sections, not five sections. Um, and, you know, then you staff appropriately. So are those staff already in place, or are they going to be, is there going to be additional staff needed to pick that load up? No, there will be additional staff. Okay. And just a comment is, I hope we don't need the district and data analysis because this is a real good point that I spoke before that sixty or seventy thousand dollars in savings could go real guys to help us pay for our iPads. Well the district data analysis position you're saying? Mm -hmm. Hopefully it can be picked up through uh, principals or administration or who you speak of that uh, we don't need this position and we use that money to bring down the cost of other uh, as, initiatives that we like. As opposed to following the recommendations of four full-time um, instructional effectiveness coaches and four K-12 curriculum coordinators? 
Well, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm gonna, we're not voting on this tonight, and I, and I want to talk to some people about the instruction of effective coaches um, by what Tony re re wrote. It certainly seems that um, they are needed. Uh, and you said by law we have to have them? No, it, it, educator effectiveness is required. That's a right. by law. And the educator effectiveness always talks about the coaches that are involved in the process. Like, it's um, one of the, it, they always call it an unfunded mandate. Um, it's, so, it's a mandate, something we must do, but they aren't giving us money to do it. And there are, although we did jump on the grants early um, to see what we could get both individually, that initial pretty much as soon as I committed to DPI, we got grant, which was, I don't know, maybe five, six months ago. I will let the board know about that one. And then the one that Tony and um, I believe Lisa and somebody from uh, Greendale worked on. But that's just for training? Yeah. Not for the actual cost of the employee? Correct. It's rare for grants to cover cost of people. Usually it's training or stuff. <clears throat> I mean, I guess the question I have, I, I, I don't know if we need four K-12 curriculum coordinators. I have no idea if that's an accurate number or not. <laughs> I have no basis for comparison. So maybe it is, maybe it's not enough. I don't know. But so, which kind of, you know, if we don't need four, well, then, you know, maybe, maybe we only need three, which time, you know, we can free up some dollars like Quinn suggested. I was talking I to Mr. Gullickson, uh, this past week at, a, at my daughter's volleyball game, and I asked him, not knowing this was on here, but I asked him about um, a few things, and one of the things that he's, he, he really said, and he was very excited, was that uh, Ms. Cerletti is the uh, K-12 coordinator above him, or he's in science, and he, he just said he couldn't say enough nice things about how that has worked to help him with his students, and uh, he thought it was a very good position to have. That's the coordinator. So now we're, we're expanding it to the other um, other cur cur curricula. So well, that's I, I, I just mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Let's go ahead, William. I just think this is a good direction to go in. I would like to see it tied to our goals. That's where I think as a board we'd feel better knowing that we have at least some way of looking at these because I know I know that investing in our teacher professional development is the best investment that we can make if we want to achieve higher results for our kids so this is the way to go so I, I think you know who, who who's best to determine how many we need that's our administration's job so I'm comfortable with that. I do agree with looking at, with the concerns about the data analysis position. Clearly, the whole idea of educator effectiveness is getting to more accountability, more accountability and better teacher practices and, and the controversial of linking teacher, per, teacher practice to student learning outcomes. And I really, I like the direction we're going in. I hope that we as a board really can set a positive tone around that. It's not meant to be punitive. It's totally meant to support our students. So we still, as a board, have to be accountable for those dollars and for the results. So I'm always looking at, you know, this is great stuff. I know what Tony's doing in our buildings, and I know what our principals are doing. are really getting better results for kids. We're so focused on that. And, and as was mentioned earlier, the mission of our district, which we also heard a lot in the listening sessions, is the... The ability to almost customize every experience for every student individually, it really takes a lot of training on the teacher's part to change a practice in the classroom. So I, I think it's great, too, that they've looked at reallocating dollars to make this work. Um, but like Glenn said, we have other needs as well. So the more that we can hone in on those skills, you know, we need data. We need to be able to analyze data. So maybe picking people that have that expertise are ready to be these um, f instructional coaches will really help. That'll really help. So. Um, as I'm looking at this, I'm not sure it's it, it hasn't been necessary in the past with this board 
don't uh, have a placeholder really. If we need a position, we come explain the, the, the reasoning behind the position and you know, if it's something that the board agrees is worthwhile, we move forward with it. Um, but that's that's the call of the finance committee or whoever when we do the budget. Uh, if we want to hold that open because we really don't have a proposal out there right now for any kind of data analysis. So, you know, when we do the budget the, you know, and we're putting it together, we might not need to actually put it there because if it's something we need in the future, We'll come to the board and say this is what we need and we'll come up with a way to possibly try to finance it does that make sense i do have one more question about these goals you said that the teachers will have student learning outcomes and the build the principals will have building outcomes school and right is this going to be aligned then to our district goals somehow or how mm -hmm. do you see that how do you see that working yeah one we're well we're we were going to there's an alignment, obviously, we just never drew the line between this and higher student achievement. Most of our district goals, which you're also going to hear about again in two weeks, um, are going to, we're going to say where we are in increasing that student achievement. And that was one of the driving factors that when I was first uh, interviewed by the board, they said, how are you going to increase student achievement? You know, so, and the board's been extremely supportive if we give a rational argument for something to increase that achievement. So we will try to draw a line between the two and only make it more clear. Right now it's kind of like a string. It'd be nice if it was a little bit more of a pathway between the two and as we develop the goals um, for the following year, it'll be nice because you'll start to understand it. and all of us, every single teacher, <laughs> they just sent out an update today DPI is designing this as they drive it. You know, it's like building the bridge as you're crossing it kind of thing, like the Army Corps of Engineers can, but the rest of us have a hard time doing that. So it's, it's, a, it's an evolving uh, system and set of requirements. But it is all research-based. Yes. That's not new. No. Um, Putting it in statewide is new. Yeah. And making it a requirement, okay. yes. If the data position, if the money spent towards the data position frees up a coordinator's or a teacher's time to spend more time on plans with kids or more time in actual student contact, then it might be money well spent. Because there's nothing that frustrates me more than seeing a classroom teacher have to run out and make photocopies and not be working on stuff with the actual kids. So if 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 that's the result of having a data position, I'd like to know that. If you know if that's going to enhance the plan and time with students, that would that would be something worth considering. Um, but we do seem to be adding incrementally a lot of costs to next year, and the year after, and I would hate to put us in a position where we're not sustainable. And I wonder if we're starting to edge close to that because we're looking at adding these little bit here, little bit here, and we're doing it in isolation. We're not looking at the big picture of what's being added. And that's a, that's a cost concern. I totally disagree that we're not looking at the big picture. We came together as, I mean, though we started with simplistic notes that are on the board over there, like aligning 612 uh, schedules, aligning K5 schedules, talked about our goals. Um, instructional coaches cost neutral um, we as a whole district are looking at what do we need here how much does Dennis get away with over there and um, I meant we as a board okay. not as an admin team and then yeah we maybe we need to do a better job of when, reporting to you guys when then. things are coming to us we're looking at it in isolation we're okay, being I asked for you. a position here we've got another program over here we've got one to one, -to -one additional costs over here and so it's easy to lose track as to how much overall we are adding as a board. No, People-wise, not, not dollar-wise necessarily. Well, both. So that, that's not what okay. the administration team is, isn't really doing. It's us as a board. It's not, sometimes hard for us to see how much we've added over time and no, how big it's getting. So <clears throat> that's a concern I have. 
Okay, anything else on instructional support staffing? Okay, I guess, David, you up for the district and preliminary district and community-wide communication plan? So, this is weird being in this spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, really awkward. Welcome. No, um, one of the district goals that was set uh, before my time um, was to improve communications within the district, and part of that was hiring this position, and the other part of it is um, constructing a communications plan. Um, that process has started, as you saw, the uh, very preliminary draft that was uh, included in your board packet tonight. Um, the plan really is focused on six key areas um, that have been identified, again, prior to my coming on board, and also um, as far as uh, they've been emphasized through discussions with board members, um, administration, and um, just about anyone I talk to uh, when it comes to how they feel Whitmill communicates uh, with its stakeholders. Um, those six areas, as I think are in the cover sheets, um, are how the district uses its website to communicate with its stakeholders, um, the way that we utilize social media, um, how or improving our media relations <coughs> and securing media placements, um, our internal communications, you know, um, that's administration to staff, staff to staff, and those types of things. Um, I kind of split out another group of uh, external uh, communication vehicles because uh, social media and our website is is are two different external vehicles, but there are a lot of other ways that we use to get messages out to people. And uh, finally, but not least important, is uh, our crisis communications and how we handle those types of situations. Uh, the reason I'm here pretty much tonight is just to tell you that we are moving forward with that goal. I know that's a goal. I'm not exactly sure when that goal is um, supposed to be met. Um, but we are in the process of getting to that point and meeting that goal. Um, and I guess really, uh, indirectly, I guess I'm here to kind of give you an update as to some of the things that I've been doing over the last several months now. I guess it's almost four months maybe. Since I'm out, four months. So um, so you, have, you all have a draft. Again, that draft is uh, very preliminary. It has not been um, viewed by... Uh, the entire administration team at all. So there is uh, certainly room for input from um, both the board and the um, and the administration team, like I said. Um, if there's any, I was told to keep it real short, so if you have any <laughs> questions about anything that's in there or if you have any questions about anything that's been uh, going on from uh, my desk, I'd be happy to answer any of those questions. So this is somewhat of a, a job description? No. Communications no. plan, no, not at all. It's actually, um, it is uh, our plan that can be presented to the board and then ultimately the public as to how we are going to, or how we are going to try to communicate all the key messages to uh, the stakeholders that need to get those messages. Um, Again, there's a, we, we utilize a lot of different vehicles to get those messages out to people, but I don't know that any, everyone understands the process as to how we do that um, or why we choose to do it the way we do it. Um, the plan is kind of uh, an explanation as to some of the things we do. The plan also has some goals in it. Um, one thing I should note about the goals is that there are a lot of things that probably could have been in the plan as goals, but we've already uh, tackled them in the first couple months that I've been here. Um, such as starting a Twitter account and utilizing social media more. I think those could have easily been goals that we would have had in the plan, um, but instead of waiting to add them to the plan or writing a plan first and then um, and then tackling goals, uh, we started to tackle some goals right off the bat. So yeah, definitely not a job description, more of a what we do as a district to communicate. <coughs> One of the, at the beginning, way before we even dreamed of having a, a wonderful person like David standing in front of us when we first did our goals, um, we said, we talked about the need to do a communication plan, a district communication plan. Um, be, we, every year we're saying, let's do a better job of communication. And every year we should be saying, what can we do better 
in, uh, to communicate what we're doing, what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are. And then prior to his being hired, I kind of did a, uh, in the cover sheet, a brief outline of what areas you'd want in that communication plan. And then I used that when I rolled over and said, this is why it would be really valuable for us to have a communication coordinator slash public relations person. And um, that's when the board agreed with, with that position. And then that's when I took that outline and I said, here you go, David. Um, and he did a really nice job of pulling it together into uh, uh, the, that communication plan format. What we haven't done yet, and, and because we wanted to start some of the goals where we are with those, so that when we come to you in two weeks, we didn't have a four-hour meeting. You know, it's old business, but this is a progress report, and we'll have people there that will just say, yep, this is what we did, and this is where we are. So it'll be a lot shorter. But this was something new and initial, and we wanted to have it in your hands for a couple weeks. So if you have questions or suggestions for improvement, you know, email it to Dave or me, and um, we will cover it as well in our admin meetings over the next couple of weeks and vet it through that way as well. And it's kind of like a handbook. We typically, I mean, the board would just, it's not a policy, it's not, it's just a, the district's plan, and then the board would say, yeah, that's a good plan, I would hope. Lynn, you had a, your hand? Well, yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering is, um, I've seen tremendous uh, improvements, and I don't have kids in the system, so that's helpful, because that's the group we really need to get to, mm -hmm. people like me now, because I'm on the board, but if all, all I did was, you know, like you on Facebook, and now I get messages in almost every day, I know one of them is going to be from Whitnall. It's amazing how much stuff is going on in this district that I did not know about. And then I also really like your brief updates to the board once in a while about all the media stuff that's been out there. That's been really helpful. I, I just think, I think it's a challenge because we don't have a local newspaper and now we're split and sometimes I don't get what Nancy gets because she lives on the other side of the street, you know, because Greenfield gets a little different now than yeah. Whitnall does. So our challenge of getting the right information out to people that's timely and correct is still there, even though you've got all of this stuff in this plan. I still think building our little database through forward thinking of, of other, uh, you know, stronger connections is going to really be helpful. I think I've, uh, um, what I learned in this position early on is that um, we really needed our, kind of like our own printing press, and that's kind of what we've become, <laughs> because um, the mm -hmm. newspaper, like you said, um, is sporadic with with no coverage um, mm -hmm. and that's the only paper that we have um, and like you said there are two different papers so that sometimes one story mm -hmm. doesn't get into the other version the Midwest version and mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of I think uh, that's definitely been a goal of ours is to uh, use the website and use social media and use the blogs that we use and, um, and that sort of thing to, to get more information out to people that they wouldn't get otherwise all of us have probably one time or another got a call from Jane from the Greenfield now. <laughs> um, I got one last week regarding um, what I would consider to be misinformation and misinterpretation of the capital improvements that you know we've been discussing at a uh, you know, fairly high level at the finance committee meetings. How important is it to you to have those types of when, you know when we get the calls to, you know, funnel them to you, say, you know, Jane, why don't you call Dave, he's our communications director, public relations individual, so that the message that we send back out is consistent. Ultimately, that's what happened, too. Um, I did speak with Jane, and I, I know Dr. Holtz did, too. Um, uh, so the two of us did speak with her. Because uh, I referred her to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it is important that we get out the right message, right. Um, certainly, because... Um, misinformation can be uh, very damaging, um, and it's hard to correct that once it's out there. Right. Um, you know, the paper might run a correction, but it's a one-line sentence that is on the front or buried somewhere in the paper that no one's going to see. Right. Um, so it is important to get the right message out. Um, I don't know that I. Um, there's a lot of different philosophies on that. I. I, I believe uh, it's okay to have more than just one voice come out of the district. Um, and that, for me, that goes, uh, you know, down to the school level. I mean, it's okay for, in my perspective, or my, 
the way I view things, I think it's okay for teachers to you know have a voice with the media when when it's an appropriate uh, when the timing is appropriate. The school board obviously is going to have a huge say in, in as to what happens with the facilities down the line. Um, so for someone to ask you your opinion, um, I'm, I'm not I'm not opposed to that, but I do appreciate uh, the idea that some of those things do get funneled through me or Dr. Holtz or or sent my way before. Um, before it does get talked about because, and like I said, it's just important to stress the accurate information and, and the points that, um, that we want to get across because, again, because uh, the coverage is somewhat sporadic, uh, we only get, sometimes only get one shot at telling the right story. So um, I do appreciate when things do get followed my way. It isn't something that We've talked about um, as a team as far as if every story has to get funneled that way through through me. Um, I would think that the plan will reflect that once we start having more discussions during our administration uh, team meetings as to um, what everyone is uh, completely comfortable with or, or what everyone you know feels is the best view to you know or the best way to, to tackle those things. One way maybe to handle it is, is if we do make comments to the media is maybe preface the comment saying this is my personal position, not necessarily the position of the board of the district. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, and again, because then if you say something that's inaccurate, then you would be held accountable and it right. wouldn't be, um, you know, a district point of view, it would be your point of view. Right. Um, so that's certainly one thing. Um, there's a lot of different ways to handle it. And again, I think we're, the plan will uh, at some point reflect the best ways and the best practices for, for this district. <clears throat> Just since you're bringing that up, I think under the crisis management communications, which you'll probably bet you should look at our, I don't know if it's in our policies or, or if it's in a handbook or somewhere, but it should be really clear that under crisis, our board president is the only, or superintendent. We should not. There is be, a policy. There's a policy on that. So that, I don't know that that aligns with what you have here. You might want to just double check that. Yeah, that's the one piece that um, yeah. it was, it was, it's not near complete yet. Right. So that, that will need a little more. I think part of the challenge is, um, especially when you're talking about crisis communications, is that it's hard to put into words every crisis that could happen. Could happen. Um, but I, I do understand what but you're the saying. Protocol, as as you can make it really clear that board members should refer all comments to the board president or the superintendent. We should never make comments during the crisis. I think, I think anyway. And that's in our crisis. We also have a crisis communication well, document that yeah, you guys okay. have, which um, Matt has worked on a lot in the past, and all of us as administrators have. <coughs> Anything else? Good job. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving along to comments from the school board regarding agenda items for future <coughs> consideration and we'll discussion or action. We have a list of things that we are chipping away at, and we'll continue to do that. Does anybody have anything else they want to add to that? Okay, in that case, we'll go to board member announcements. Anybody have anything you want to announce? Just a brief reminder, we have a fabulous musical coming up at the high school. Tickets are actually available online this year. Uh, so don't be afraid to go online and purchase your tickets. They will still be available at the door, um, but Grease is shaping up to be quite a production. Should be another good one. And related to that, um, I think the senior dinner is March 19th. Mm -hmm. Do you have enough volunteers or um, yes, you need waiters and waitresses? Um, the National Honor Society students are right. coming in like usual to help us out with some serving and we've had some staff members volunteer their time and as long as the board members are all welcome. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, anybody have anything else? Uh, okay. no, no. I just had a comment. With the amount of information that we were given in our board packet today, it would be much appreciated if we could really get that out by Thursday. Um, I have two very active kids and when I, by the time I got home I work on Friday, um, I looked at it, and, and if a lot of the information, if I wouldn't have been at the finance committee meeting, all the information that Doug had given, it, it had been way too much to get done. Um, so it's really important to get the information to us as soon as possible. All right, we have candidates formed tomorrow in this room at 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, and one other item, and I forgot the exact date, May 3rd or 6th, um, 
it was a one day board education session mm -hmm. uh, of all places it's always at the Dells for some reason I don't know it must May be third. A, it's May 3rd is it yeah it's a one day session if you haven't seen it we'll get you out the invite um, uh, Looks like a pretty good session. You normally is about five or six agenda items. The Spring Academy. The spring Academy. Of, uh, yeah. okay. Probably dates. Aren't there for new board member orientation already too? We should look into that for our candidates. This particular one, they they actually recommend it yeah. for new board candidates. For new candidates, so yeah. On your calendar. Yeah. Anything else? Is your hand up, Stephanie? Or are you <laughs> okay? If not, I'll need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Motion, second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay.